as well. What are you hoping will help ease tensions? President Lee aims to navigate towards peace. Their ultimate national vision and objective is to achieve peaceful reunification. Taller than Princess Diana? No, not by an inch. Can you really freeze fat off your... Yes, is apparently the answer. These are real stories I've done for Good Morning America, but in real serious stories, I've also crisscrossed the country covering the presidential elections. I've covered tornadoes in Kansas, terrorist bombings in Kenya, and the re-reburial of the SARS in Russia. I've traveled the world and done stories about cheating husbands and abusive wives and people who are addicted to everything that it's possible to be addicted to, money, food, sex, gambling, oh, and drugs too, don't worry, I've done that. <clears throat> but people often ask me, who's the most memorable person you've ever interviewed? And, and that's a really tough question. I mean, is it a celebrity like the Beyonce interview you saw, Celine Dion, Clint Eastwood? They're all deeply cool, I guarantee you. And, is it a politician? I mean, I got, an, I got a tour of the vice presidential mansion from Joe Biden, that was cool. But really, as the mother of three young boys, 10, seven, and three, I really think that it's the interviews of the children that linger with me. I remember covering the hurricanes in uh, the Dominican Republic and talking to a young boy who had lost everything in his shanty town. He was a shoeshine boy who literally didn't own a pair of shoes. And I asked him, what's your favorite food? And it took him a long time. I mean, he was clearly malnourished, and he couldn't think of an answer. And in that moment of silence, I thought, wow, this is incredibly profound. And he came up with an answer. He said, bread, and maybe a little butter. And it's those kinds of interviews that stay with me and linger for a long time. I've been the news anchor at GMA for about a year and it's just gone flowing, flying past so fast. I was in Haiti after the earthquake and returned with the faces of those young kids etched into my memory forever. They too were all smiles and playing with like little plastic cars that they had fashioned out of milk cartons and it was really amazing, the, the resilience, the perseverance. And last June, as you saw from the clip, I went to Korea for the 60th anniversary of the onset of the war. Um, I interviewed Lee Byung-hun, who I kept referring to as the Brad Pitt of Korea, but now I think Brad Pitt is the Lee Byung-hun of the United States. <laughs> I interviewed the Tucson Temple chairman, and I got to interview the president of South Korea, who in many ways is an allegory for the, Chris the history of South Korea in the last 60 years. You know, he was impoverished, dirt poor after the war. He had to recycled garbage to put himself through college, and he rose through the ranks to become the president and CEO of Hyundai, 
heavy industry, think about that. And then he became, of course, the mayor of Seoul and the president of Korea. Um, and he was so proud of the fact that 60 years ago after the war, Korea was one of the poorest 20 countries in the world. And just this past week, President Obama and the leaders of the top 20 economic powers met in Seoul because Korea hosted the first non-G8 hosting of the G20 summit, and it was something that we can all take tremendous pride in. <clears throat> the Korean government also sponsored an impressive number of American veterans who had fought in the Korean War, and I got to interview one of them. And you saw a little bit of it in the piece, Captain Mark Hafferty. He talked about how his brother had died in action and how he, as a result, didn't have to fight because he was a lone heir, a survivor. But he said he didn't want to dishonor his brother's memory and not fight, so he went. And he marveled at the fact that Korea had done so well in the last 60 years, and he said he was so proud and so gratified by that. And we both couldn't help but wonder about those who serve in the armed forces today in Iraq and Afghanistan, and wonder what their fields of battle will look like in 60 years. It was amazing also to just see the changes in Seoul. I mean, we left when I was so young, and I met my up with my father's uncle, who it turns out I had always known he was a big shot, you know, he'd been an ambassador and a head of Korean Airlines, but it turns out he was also, and I only discovered this this summer, a genuine bona fide Korean War veteran. The American government had given Korea 10 fighter planes, P-51s, Mustangs, and he was one of eight, one of 10 who flew them, and eight of them were shot down and killed, and he was only one of two that survived. Um, I learned a lot of personal history, I learned a lot about the history of Korea, and I, for that I want to thank my father and my mother, who really raised me to know about our heritage, to be proud of being Korean American, but also to look in a very visionary way to the future. And I think that's what journalists do. We are mindful of the past with an eye towards the future. <clears throat> it is our legacy in many ways, and whether we fight for our country or whether we're actresses like Grace Park, and I have a girl crush on her too, I have to admit. <laughs> Although I also have a crush on Tano Park, so it kind of evens out. So whether you play baseball or are a hip-hop artist or you work for ESPN or have a show on Oprah's channel, we are all children of parents who've worked incredibly hard and sacrificed so much so that we can have that future that we all dream about. I trust that we'll all do that. Thank you so much.